Hi, my name is Audrey Cooper. I'm the editor-in-chief of the San Francisco Chronicle, and welcome to this awesome event today. Thanks. I want to give you just a little bit of bookkeeping, what's going to happen here before, before I, I bring out the woman that you really want to see. Um, the senator will speak for about 30 minutes, and then she'll take some questions from the crowd. There's no reporters in here, right? It's on the record. Okay. <laughs> Well, you let me know. <laughs> um, she'll take about 30 minutes of questions, and then she will go out to the lobby to sign copies of her book for you. So, so after everybody's done talking, don't leave. There's still more to it. So, uh, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm fond of saying at the Chronicle that what we do is write the first draft of history. Um, occasionally, after we've written that first draft, a memoir or a book or some other information comes out that really brings some context to those headlines that you see in the paper or online. And I think this book uh, by the senator comes out at a really interesting time politically for our country when we're torn perhaps more than ever before between right and left, anti-establishment and not. And one thing that I got from Senator Boxer's books is over and over, in example and example, she really shows us the behind the scenes information from people who are making the important decisions for our country. And it really told me that this threshold we seem to have in this country on whether or not you want to vote for somebody you'd like to have a beer with is probably not the best thing that we should be doing for the electoral process. I love Berkeley crowds. You can read the politics into that, can't you? So The Art of Tough is the name of her book, and it literally goes back to her roots, back when Marin County was a red county. I don't even, re I, this was before I was born, but evidently it happened. Um, and even when so-called progressives were challenging whether a young mother should run for office. And it concludes, of course, with what she plans to do next, as far as she knows, after she leaves the Senate this year, after 40 years of elected office. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that you will learn when you read her book is that one of her first jobs, of course, was being a reporter. And I suggested to her that we are hiring if she finds herself unemployed after leaving the Senate. So maybe one of you can, in question time, help me encourage that. Uh, without further ado, Senator Barbara Boxer. Oh, gosh, this is so wonderful to have you all here. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm excited that you came. Because, you know, write a book, ask people to come and hear about it. What if you didn't come? It would be so awful. And you came, and I'm so happy. And I did something last night in, at the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco that was also quite, quite nice. Um, so we're here at an amazing moment. Uh, and uh, I know you're going to want to ask me lots of questions about what's happening, like now, um, <laughs> from the last Donald Trump rant, and uh, I'm happy I will answer all those, and when I uh, complete in about 30 minutes or so, uh, then there'll be, you can line up in the middle over here, here and here, and you can ask those questions, uh, or whatever questions, about the book, about anything that you really want. And then I hope afterwards we'll get to meet one another, and I'll sign a book to you personally, and take a picture with your iPhone if you want, <laughs> but not a selfie. I don't like those, but someone will be there to snap it of us. Okay, so I've written four books. This is the fourth book, and this book is like no other because I guess I'm at a point in my life where I'm just ready to lay it out there for you. And I did it over a three-year period uh, on the long flights. Is there any water, you guys? Oh, God. I did it on those long flights. How many of you have ever taken those long flights across country? <laughs> I do it, in most cases, almost every week. Uh, so 
there was time, and I would just write it the old-fashioned way. Then I'd get the story home, and I'd sit down at the computer and, and make sure it was in there. Hit save and pray I wouldn't lose it. And um, it took three years to, to look at all of those pages I had written. Because once I wrote them, I didn't really look back. And I realized, in many ways, it's a living history. It's all the issues a lot of us have gone through together. Um, you know, the environmental movement, the peace movement with Vietnam, the uh, AIDS crisis, uh, the Iraq war, climate change, the environment, just everything we've been through. Clarence Thomas, as an example. And um, when you're inside the place, where policy is made, you recognize, and this is what I want to make sure that my readers know, the difference it makes as to who is in the room, OK? Or who is not in the room. And in this country, and I talk a lot about voting rights and voter suppression and the things that are happening, it has been a struggle to get people in the room who really reflect the diversity of our nation. And of course, you and I have gone through this together, fighting for that diversity. And the irony of this election is, as we make more and more progress, we have a Republican nominee who insults two-thirds of the country, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, the Art of Tough. It's a great name. It was a name that my uh, wonderful agent, Kimberly, came up with because I knew I wanted tough in the title. And I'll tell you why. All through my career, and a lot of you follow, you've seen me sometimes stand alone. You've seen me stand with a small group. You've seen me go toe to toe with some vicious folks. And um, people would always come up to me and say, how can you stand it? Why do you do it? You're so tough. And I just say, no, I'm not. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn, you know, I grew up aware of my surroundings, but I'm just an ordinary person. Um, my mother never graduated from high school. My father went to school at night, got his degree, got his law degree at night. And I went to public school all the way from kindergarten through college. I'm, I'm not tough. But then I realized at one point, I am tough. And, uh, and I wanted to explain that to you in the book. So, the, so part of the book is what it really takes. It's an empowerment book, not only for young people, for all of us. What does it take? Because in your life, and I don't care what you do, whether it's in your family life, whether it's in your community life, whether it's in your job, in your organization, people, if you have some strong views, people will try to shut you down. They will have their own reasons why. And it becomes an intimidating situation. And what I want to tell everybody, regardless, male, female, old, young, middle, that there are ways to deal with it. And I call it the art of tough. And there are nine principles that I've lived by, never realizing until I sat down here where I learned them and who taught me them. And it was a shock to me as I sat down to write about my early life, because the first thing I did is just write all the stories I wanted to share that take you into those rooms where we fight for the heart and soul of our great country. I also recognize it was my mother who taught me, you know, 80% of these lessons. I had thought it was going to be my dad because he was the role model, but it was my mother. And I'll share a little bit with you uh, how I learned some of these things. So twofold reason for the book. Tell the stories. Take you inside those stories. Show you some of the characters uh, that we see every day on TV and what it means to struggle with them or work with them, what it means to stand alone, how you are going to be tough. So that's the twofold purpose of the book. What I do in the book is because I want people to understand 
the part about tough. So I want to read to you just kind of the opening couple of pages here, and uh, it'll set the stage. And I have to watch the clock because I'm a senator. We talk too much, so I have to make sure. About five, okay. So this is, by the way, the, the preface is, is written by Kirsten Gillibrand. How many of you know who she is? Raise your hand. For those of you who don't, she's the a junior senator from New York. Chuck Schumer is the senior senator. And Kirsten uh, ran for Hillary Clinton's seat and won that seat after Hillary went into the State Department. She's pretty fabulous. And people say, how can you leave? You know, first they said, how can you stand it? Then when I said, I'm leaving, they said, why are you leaving? <laughs> I said, well, one of the reasons is people like Kirsten are there to carry that banner um, on a woman's right to choose and women's health care and uh, fighting for equality for everybody, for gay rights, lesbian rights, transgender. She's really fabulous. And there are many others there, too. And you know, on the environment, people like Sheldon Whitehouse and Brian Schatz and people you'll come to know who were taking that banner, so important to me. Or frankly, I wouldn't have left. And the fact that our state is blue makes it great. And yesterday I was on TV and they said, well, what's your prediction about the Senate race? And I said, well, um, I'll go out on a limb. There's going to be a strong Democratic woman <laughs> taking my seat. Um, <laughs> um, so OK, so here you are. You've bought my book, and you open it up, first chapter. I'm no martial artist or big-time, high-stakes moneymaker. I barely measure five feet, maybe five-three in my high heels, and nobody's ever accused me of having a menacing presence. No, but I have lived with an emotional intensity, a sense of indignation, determination, and sometimes outrage that has often inspired opposing reactions among my political colleagues, voters, and right-wing pundits who have said these and other quotable things about me. Now, I'm not going to read you all of them. I'll just read you a couple, because I want to entice you. Some of these are unbelievable. OK, here's one from our friend Ann Coulter. Here it is. Barbara Boxer is a great candidate for the Democratic Party, female and learning disabled. That's one of the nicer ones, right. Um, here's another one. Barbara Boxer continues to prove that she is unfit for any office higher than turd inspector. And one of the strangest ones of all I will share with you you know Michael Savage? Is that a yes or a no? Um, I hope you don't for your sanity, but this is what he wrote. <laughs> In the future, Barbara Boxer may be remembered as the Frau Dr. Mengele of the US Senate. And in case you didn't get the reference, he now goes on to explain it. Dr. Joseph Mengele, the Nazi war criminal who directed merciless human experiments may have decided to come back as a woman. <laughs> that gives you a small sample. Now, how do you respond <laughs> when people say these things? How do you deal with it? Well, the art of tough is you actually wear it as a badge of honor, but it's not as easy as it sounds because Sometimes there's a chorus of that kind of thing, such as when I voted against the Iraq War, was one of 23 people. And when I, uh, I opposed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, was a group, very small group of people. When I opposed um, doing away with the Glass-Steagall Act, I was one of seven. And, and I stood actually virtually all alone, objecting to the Ohio vote count in the Kerry Bush election because people in minority communities were standing online for 12 hours in the rain. Now, don't tell me that's a fair election. And uh, I stood alone, and I got, well, they tried to humiliate me, but I just stood my ground. 
And then some really wonderful people, probably from Berkeley, sent me roses, which was... <laughs> Thank you, Berkeley. That was really good. Um, so I established the fact that you really kind of have to be tough. But I also wanted to tell you, as my readers, that part of the art of tough is also having a sense of humor. And you have to have a sense of humor. You can't be humorless. Because if you don't, you'll just be miserable. So when things happen, I always fell back on writing limericks. And uh, not as good as Hamilton. Nothing like that, you know, the show. But I wrote limericks, and I wrote lyrics to songs, uh, which I would sing with colleagues who could carry a tune. And um, I've written them all through the time I've been in politics. So in a way, and they're in the book, they're sprinkled throughout the book, and then they're in the back, too. Um, and they also show you uh, history and what it was like in a way with a biting sense of humor, I hope. But I'll tell you, there was only one time, and I wrote about everything, that I actually changed policy, and I will share it with you. When I got to um, the House, this takes me way back to 82, I got elected, so 83, I came straight from being a county supervisor in Marin, and I had that California sensibility of working out, exercise, and that was the heyday. We were finding out it was good for you, blah, blah, blah. You could live longer, you could be ha happier. And all those endorphins, remember? We learned that then. And so I asked, where's the gym? And they said, well, there's the men's gym, but there's a little tiny women's gym. I said, OK, what? fine. And uh, we, we had an experience, because I asked my friend Claudette, who was a really good aerobics teacher, I said, would you teach the Democratic women of the house? There weren't many of us. Remember, 435, we had about 20 something. And um, I said, we want to work out in the gym. So we go to this woman's gym, which is maybe half the size of this stage, with five humongous hair dryers. You know the old-fashioned kind that go the hood over here? Because after all, why else would a woman want a gym? Only just to blow her hair dry or something. So walking in there, we had Olympia Snow, Geraldine Ferraro, I know, Barbara Mikulski. By the way, I have a great picture of Jerry in the book. Barbara Mikulski, um, Barbara Canelli, myself, and I, I don't maybe Claudine Schneider, I can't remember. There were just a f six of us. But you couldn't fit more than six people in this gym. So, we <laughs> so Claudette is standing looking at us, and she's, we line up. She says, uh, everybody put your arms out to the side. Well, we're hitting each other, you know. But, <laughs> but we were brave. She said, OK, I'll do something else. She says, raise your hands above your head. Everybody does it. Now, she says, put your hands on your hips. And with that, Barbara Mikulski said, if I could find my hips, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> this happened. And so everyone got hysterical, and we looked around at the five hair dryers, and we said, this is not working. And I did what I should have done in the first place. I went to the powers that be. You know, uh, it was Eddie Boland was his name. He was a senior senator who dealt with, a um, House member, sorry, who dealt with all of the administrative facilities. And so I said, Eddie, you know, the women, we just need to get into that gym. And well, what are you going to change? And we, well, you, we can use the old gym to change in, shower in. We just need to use that gym and use all that. Oh, no, that's not possible. What do you mean it's not possible? It's just not. It's not the way it's done, and it's not going to happen. So that was Democrats. I didn't even bother going the other side. So my friend, I was very upset about it. And I said, I had a meeting with Tony Coelho. Any of you remember Tony? He was a terrific uh, House member. And he was then the whip. I said, Tony, this is outrageous. I don't want to cause a ruckus. This is it. And he said, um, well, let me see. What can we do? I said, you know, I'm thinking I'll write a song, a funny song about it. 
And I'll sing it to you. If you think it's good, maybe we can use it, use our sense of humor and get in the gym. So I find Mary Rose O'Carr and Marcy Kaptur, both from Ohio. Marcy, she's still a congresswoman. And I write a song. So I am going to sing it if you promise not to record. So we get a guitar player, and we sing this song, and eventually we sing it to Tip, and we sing it to Eddie Bolin, and it goes like this. Exercise, glamorize, where to go will you advise? Can't everybody use your gym? <laughs> it goes on. I won't sing the whole thing. Equal rights, will wear tights, Let's avoid those macho fights. Can't everybody use your gym? Then we have a bridge and we have a big ending. Because we're only asking. Anyway, we get in the gym. We get in the gym. So over the years, I thought, well, maybe I can really change policy with these. Songs. So trying to end the war in Iraq, I tried one. Don't cry for me, Condoleezza. You are the one who told us of tubes aluminum, of weapons there were none. Your truth was half-baked, like yellow fake cake. It didn't work. I tried. So the point of the art of tough, and I've demonstrated it to you, is to have a sense of humor to fall back on when things really don't make much sense. It, you may strike out, but you're going to lighten things up. Lighten things up. And sometimes it has a salutary impact. Um, so, you got me to sing, or I sang myself? I hope I, um, I'm going to skip a little bit. We have about 10 more minutes, would you say? Five? 10? You like it? You like what I'm doing? Okay. Um, I'm going to, wait a minute, oh, is my record coming out? Um, to turn to something very serious, there's only one reason that I got elected to the United States Senate. Obviously, I had a lot of support, a lot of support in this room. If you remember back in 92, Diane Feinstein and I were running two women, the seat was Two seats were up. It happens very rarely, and I won't go into the reasons, but two seats were up. And the word around California, not here, but around most of California was, one woman, maybe. Two women, never. We're hearing it sort of on the presidential thing. Now. OK. So Diane and I, we were thrown together. We're very different personalities and a little bit different parts of the party, but we really worked well together. And we got really annoyed when people would say, are you kidding? Two women from one state? And by the way, they'd say, two women from Northern California? And then you know the zinger. Two Jewish women from Northern California? <laughs> so we used our sense of humor, the art of tough. Diane would say, 2% may be fine. You know how she's so she has so much gravitas, I should say. 2% may be fine for the fat content of milk, but it is not good enough as far as representation of women in the Senate, which is only 2%. And people loved it. And then I do something a little bit less formal, and I said, if ever there was a time for a lot of chicken soup, it's now in this country. <laughs> so we did. And then, uh, and then when they really, when it really got to me, I, I reached pretty deep for tough, and I'd say, you know, I never heard you say anything when two Protestant men uh, were, uh, were elected from one state. What is this? So we managed to make history, but Anita Hill was the reason. Her courage to do what she did and to paint the picture for you, I think you must remember that we were coming out of the Bork nomination, and, you know, he went down and never got it, and the committee headed by Joe Biden was a little nervous because they didn't want to have two, you know, blocking two judges in a row. But here's this guy. So they rushed through the hearings, and I'm sure some of you will remember, on, uh, after the hearings were closed, Anita Hill comes forward because she was asked 
in the FBI review, she comes forward and she says, I have to say that this man has harassed me and he's uh, sexually harassed me. He said obnoxious things to me constantly. And uh, so she was uh, questioned under oath about this, first of all, uh, quietly in a deposition. And they decided they were not going to open up the hearings. Well, I was in the house then, and Pat Schroeder and I, uh, and several other, Patsy Mink, Jolene Unsold, you may not, Nita Lowy, you may not know all these people. Between us, we had 100 years of experience in politics. We said, this is ridiculous. This is a Democratic Senate, and they're not going to open up these hearings? That's why, friends, when someone says, I'm the establishment, of course you're kidding, because I went right up against them. And what did we do? We marched over to the Senate. You, how many of you are aware of that photo of us marching up the Senate steps? Some of you are. Some of you may not be. It's in the book. Um, <laughs> And I had to pay a lot of money to get it in the book. So it's, it's a very iconic picture. Because of this, we're marching up the steps, but you can see in our body language, you know, the intensity, the outrage, the sense of purpose as we marched up the steps. So we knew the Democratic senators were having lunch right behind the door we were about to knock on. So we march up the steps. Now, if you'll notice in the book that I'm leading the charge. That's not really fair. It was Schroeder's idea, but California working out in good shape. <laughs> I'm up the step. They're all going, ha, ha. I'm going, ah, ah, ah. And so we get to the top of the steps, the door. OK, so, yeah? <laughs> so I say, I think I answered, I said, well, we're about six members of the House, and we want to see the senators. They're having lunch. We want five minutes. We want to make the case as to why Anita Hill deserves to be heard. And the woman who opens up the door crack says, we don't let strangers in the Senate. <laughs> and I actually wrote a book about that called Strangers in the Senate. I was so stunned. I said, how can you call us strangers? Oh, don't take it personally, she says. It's just a term of art for those who are not uh, senators, which was a bunch of baloney because we've never used that, and I've been in the Senate a long time. She just tried to intimidate us. So the art of tough kicked in, and I said to her, OK, you're saying we can't meet with the senators. We can't go in there. That's right. Well, we'll George Mitchell step out and meet with us? No, he's too busy. He's leading the lunch in there. So I said, OK, here's the deal. He either meets with us, or we're going to walk down these stairs. And I said to her, what do you see down the stairs? She says, 35 cameras. I said, that's right. They saw us go up. And if we come back down, having not met with our colleagues, it's going to be front page stories. She says, OK, he'll be right there. So we meet with George, and George commits to open up the hearings. I have to tell you, the feeling I had, you know, of speaking truth to power, of making a difference, of working with my female friends, I was so happy. And at that time, I was running for the Senate, and I had a long shot campaign. So I thought that's the end of Clarence Thomas, because she's so credible. There's no way they're going to hear from her and confirm Clarence Thomas to the court. I was wrong. And I want you to know, which is hard to do, I blame myself. And I'm going to read you that portion. I blame myself for not focusing more on what was happening behind the scenes after we had marched up the steps of the Senate. I might have learned in real time what I learned much later, that the committee had refused to allow the testimony of other women, Angela Wright and Rose Jordan, both of whom were prepared to say that Thomas had made unsolicited sexual advances. Wright, who'd worked for Thomas at the EEOC until he fired her, said he had, said he had pressured her for dates, asked about the size of her breasts, 
and made similar comments about other women. Jourdain said Thomas was always commenting on her body, and Sakari Hardnett, another former Thomas assistant, told the judiciary staff, quote, if you were young black female, reasonably attractive, and worked directly for Thomas, you knew full well you were being inspected and auditioned as a female. Then there was an article that came out in 93 uh, in the New Yorker by Jane Mayer and Jill Abramson, stated that Joe Biden had abdicated control of the Thomas confirmation hearings and didn't call four women who traveled to Washington to corroborate Anita's claims. They also would, were going to say that Thomas had lied under oath since they'd seen video rental records showing his interest in use of pornography. Looking back, I failed to do the follow through. I failed big time. Not that it would have been easy. We women of the house were seen as the enemy. We really were. Enemies of the status quo, of the way things were, of the gentlemanly way things were. I believe that even my buddy Joe Biden had to succumb to the vast majority of his committee members on both sides. It's a long, sad story, and there's even more. In 2010, Clarence Thomas's wife, Virginia, left a voicemail on Anita Hill's office phone at Brandeis over a weekend, demanding that the professor say she was sorry for accusing her husband of sexually harassing her. Quote, this is the message, I would love you to consider an apology sometime and some full explanation of why you did what you did with my husband, the voicemail said, in part, according to NBC News. So give it some thought and certainly pray about this and come to understand why you did what you did. And then I say, incredible, isn't it? Professor Hill called the message inappropriate and reported it to her employer's security department, who in turn reported it to the FBI. Further, Professor Hill said she had no reason to atone. Quote, this is from Anita. I have no intention of apologizing because I testified truthfully about my experience, and I stand by that testimony. So what I tried to show in this book in the most honest way I can, you know, where I was right, where I was wrong, the pain that I felt in my heart over the Iraq war, I did every single thing I could do to try and stop it. Read the names of the dead, read the name of the, of the wounded, were told on the floor, you're over emotional for naming and honoring the dead and the wounded. I talk about the craziness of the fight uh, for, cl for climate change, to do something about it, that I have to go against people who say, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a scientist. Well, that is a fact and evidence. You are not a scientist, so follow the science. 98% of the people, scientists tell us, it is real, it is here, it is dangerous. And we see it every single day. And it's something we owe our grandchildren, for God's sakes, to get on top of this and try to make sure that the impacts aren't as bad as they would be. Um, you know, I often say this whole thing of I'm not a scientist. If my colleagues who say that went to the doctor and the doctor said, you have a really massive tumor and it has to come out, they wouldn't leave there saying, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. They would go get a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth opinion, and if 98% of the doctors said they have a tumor and it has to come out, they would take it out. So. These are the things I talk about in the book. There's a sense of humor in it. There's some sadness to it. There's some happy times to it. But I guess I'll end and tell you, without you, I never would have been able to write this book because you supported me through thick and thin when it wasn't easy. And I just want to thank you so much for coming out here today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so touched by that. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a question, if you have a question, please line up in either one of these. 
aisles. We'll take a question one at a time. We'll go back and forth. So if you have a question, just jump into the aisle, and we'll take one question at a time. Okay, then I'll come to you. Thank you for telling me. Just raise your hand. We'll try to get to you. Thank you for saying that. All right, first question right over here. You can hold it. Oh. How do you think if um, Hillary Clinton gets elected, or even if Bernie Sanders managed this somehow, how will they, how will Hillary as a woman be able to affect change in the Congress? Because we know what uphill battle Obama had, and now we will see Hillary having even more of an uphill battle. So how, well, I don't how know, I don't know do if she'll have more of an uphill battle. I think any president will have an uphill battle. It's just the nature of the times we live in, you know, where the country is very split. But my view is, if anyone can do it, it's someone who actually served in the United States Senate, both Bernie and Hillary did. It's not going to be somebody like Trump, because he doesn't even know anything. And I mean, he doesn't know how a bill becomes a law. Even reading it, I doubt he's ever read it, let alone really understand it. Um, and I, don't, I do not intend to send him my book. Uh, but but I, I just very positive about the future. If we get a Democratic president, let me say why. Barack Obama, there could be some disagreement here. I think when all is said and done, will go down as one of the greatest presidents we've ever had. And I want to explain why I say that. Because you have to understand what that man inherited in terms of an economy in free fall. I'm talking no safety net. I'm talking about a freeze in credit where even the California treasurer would call me every day saying, I can't get overnight money. The banks have frozen the credit. We were in such a situation that Ben Bernanke, who, by the way, I voted against him because I was so mad about what happened in the real estate market, and I made a mistake because what he did was to use every fiscal tool that he could because there, were, there was a lot of trouble in Congress and we couldn't do a big enough stimulus to get our way out of it. We were losing tens of thousands of jobs a week and I could tell you that that man, Barack Obama, came in, he saved this economy, we got paid back every dime for the bailout, which was a horrible vote for me, but did it, got paid back every dime for it. He saved the auto industry, that's absolutely a fact. He stood up to, you know, the right wing, he ended two wars, he, first he took them off the credit card, then he ended them, okay? Now, yes, people are saying we still have soldiers. They're true, but they're not in a combat mission. The fact is, at the end of the day, he slashed the deficit by two-thirds. I think that Hillary Clinton is the candidate who will build on his record. And I didn't even mention Obamacare. Now, is it perfect? Of course not. Would some of us like to see the public option? Of course. But the fact is, you don't throw that out for some you know, prayer that you'll get something better. You've got to build on it, build on it. And I think Hillary, with her experience in foreign policy, and yes, her negatives are soaring because she had 18 Republican candidates beaten up on her, let alone some of these people who, you know, wrote some disgraceful things. She did, in fact, bring back the status of America in the world when she was the Secretary of State. We were down at you know, below zero. So I'm optimistic, and the last thing I'll say to you is we've got to elect a better Congress. We've got to get Nancy Pelosi as, you know, the Speaker of the House, this Paul Ryan. Oh, this Paul Ryan. You know, what kind of a morality is it to say, this man is terrible, he's awful, but yes, I'm going to vote for him. Well, this is not the right thing for a leader to do. But anyway, I won't get into Trump, will I? Yeah, all right. All right, Gary, you stand up. So Gary has another microphone. Gary, why don't you walk over to anybody who couldn't come down an aisle. Just raise your hand if you have a question and you are All not going to come Gary, in aisle. Gary, to left, your left. Here, the lady in the green. Okay, and I'm going to come right here, and you're next. Thank you. Um, Obama has nominated someone to the Supreme Court, and it seems like nothing is happening. And I'm wondering sure. about your thoughts about that and what can be done. Oh, thank you. It's such a great question. If you read the Constitution, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, just remember 2, Article 2, <laughs> Section 2, Clause 2, 
It is very clear. I am not an attorney, but I am married to one. And by the way, he's here tonight, Stuart Boxer, this afternoon. There he is. 54 years of putting up with me. And I'm going to get to it, but I will say one of my favorite lines I wrote in the book is to, talking about Stu. I talk about how I met him and all of that, and what I loved about him and all of that. And then I say, he married... Debbie Reynolds, and he woke up with gold in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> but he seems to like Golda, okay, so we're all right. Um, the difference is I could type, and she could not type Golda Meir, and I could type. Um, Merrick Garland, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2. Here's what it says. When there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court, the president shall nominate, not may, shall nominate a replacement, and the Senate shall advise and consent. Now, I read it. That's it. I read it 100 times. I didn't see the part that says, except if you don't like who the president is. <laughs> no, it was not there. Or except if you're annoyed and you want to wait till after the next election. No. It says shall. Now, my understanding is somebody, some citizen, I'm not sure exactly who has actually sued the Senate, where that goes, I don't know, to say they're not doing their constitutional job. Now, this, yeah, this, um, this nominee is a consensus nominee. This nominee is, has an incredible record of thoughtfulness, of caring, and the Republicans are trying to find places where he was wrong. They found some gun cases. They um, are being impossible. I'll tell you, what, and I'm glad you raised this. I met with Merrick Garland. He is just what you see, just a very calm, just a very bookish, serious judge. He doesn't have an agenda, but he wants to make sure that this country does the right thing on all the issues. Now, we have a deadlocked Supreme Court. They're deadlocked in certain cases. So actually what you have is either they'll kick back a case and it just hangs in limbo, or they'll say, um, okay, certain parts of the country will have this law and certain parts of the country will have this law. And all these issues before them, voting rights cases, workers' rights cases, uh, you know, a, a woman's right to choose cases, these are not, you know, idle conversations or small matters. They're giant matters and environment and all of these things. So it's outrageous. I'll, I'll tell you a cute story, though. Chuck Grassley, you know who he is? Boo, yeah. He is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and he has said, I will not even hold a hearing. I will not meet with him. I don't know if he met with him or not, but who cares? If you're not going to hold a hearing, this is the first time in history. We've always had hearings, okay? We've always had a vote. And they can still filibuster. They can still vote no. They won't even meet with him, some of them. So anyway, a woman is running against Chuck Grassley. Her name is Patty Judge. And she says, finally a judge he'll have to debate with. That's her thing. That, She's very cute. Send her $2 or whatever you have. We have to get her to, be, to win. But your question is um, a deep and important one. I have no hope, no hope, that they're going to do anything. The only chance we have is if we win big in November, and they're saying, oh, maybe we should do this guy. He is over 60. Maybe he won't live that long. You know, because the next president could put, a Democrat could put on a 45-year-old. Not a bad idea. <laughs> Let's play the averages. <laughs> we want them in there for a long time. Thank you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Can you believe anyone as amazing as she is? She just steps out there. Anyway, that's my answer. I, I don't have a good, you know, prognosis on what's going to happen. Good question. Gary, go ahead. It is an honor, and uh, this might be my only time during my life to say that you are my Shiro. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay. Um, 
since the Vietnam War, since we dedicated ourselves to being uh, anti-war, you have just been steadfast. You stood by your ethics and principles. You deserve some kind of huge medal. My question, <laughs> my question is, yeah. when we have Hillary as president, and when this happens in November, and you get the phone call to serve, what position would you serve in oh, under God. the <laughs> Hillary? Uh, is there a position that you would serve in? Would you consider a cabinet position or even Supreme Court, please? Well, no way Supreme Court, I'm not a lawyer, but no way anything. I'm not interested in another job. I wanna be myself and I wanna be, and I'm not retiring. I just can't tell you all the different things I'm gonna be doing, but I'm telling you a hint. I wanna to go toe to toe with Karl Rove. I wanna to go toe to toe with the Koch brothers. No woman in the country ever does it. And you know, I, I understand what it means for these progressive Senate candidates to get reelected and what they need. I'm gonna be out there, but my view is in terms of having a position in a cabinet, um, it's not right for me at this point in my life. I'm too much who I am, and um, I've, because of you, I've had the chance to be who I am, even though sometimes it's elicited some interesting uh, responses. But um, if there was some specific thing, I'll make it up. You know, the status of women in Afghanistan, it was a special invoice thing, you know, something that really that I could do, and it had a beginning, and it had a middle and it had an end. And I could bring it home. I would be honored to do something like that. But I thank you so very much for your beautiful uh, comments. They mean a great deal to me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, Senator Boxer, my wife and I are here because you're our hero as well. And I have two questions for you. Sure. One is um, Hillary, uh, Clinton gave a terrific speech uh, not too long ago in which she, for the first time, it seems, really took on her opponent, uh, her likely opponent. And uh, concern of a lot of people is, will she keep it up? And so my question to you is, can you uh, teach her the art of tough? Okay. Um, and my... My, and so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. My second question is, uh, can you get Peter True to call his parents? Oh, are you his dad? Soon. Oh, my God. That's, I just love P Peter and I have been texting each other because he's the biggest Warriors fan <laughs> in the entire nation. And he and I go back and forth with little notes to each other. Oh, my God, I can't breathe. You know, we... He says, relax, we're going to be okay. He's the best. Peter True is my press secretary. So here's what I want to say. Um, Hillary Clinton has been vilified her whole life because she's gone up against the grain, just as I have, but she in a more, you know, even, what's the word, a bigger stage. As first lady, she pushed the envelope. As she says, there was Hillary Care before there was Obamacare. And, and the 18 people who ran, I guess most of them were people, who ran for the Republican <laughs> nomination, um, they had one unifying you know, idea, go after Hillary. So now here's the woman who steps down after having raised the, you know, the reputation of America in the world, and she's got 18 of these dudes going after her. Boom, 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 boom. I don't have to teach her the art of tough. I don't. Honest to God, she knows it. Now, I, I just want to close with this. I am, forgive me, because you know, I know some of you are Bernie people. God bless you. God bless him. But I just want to say about Hillary, I am so tired of hearing she's not authentic. And I want to talk about that. She is authentic. She is not a backslapper. She is not an easy politician. She is not a big rally, rah-rah person. She's a workaholic. She is a workhorse, not a show horse. She knows more about issues than probably almost everyone else 
in the country. That is her authenticity. I don't want to change her into Barbara Boxer or to Peter True or to Bernie Sanders. Um, you know, can you imagine her saying, we're going after the billionaires. It doesn't work for her. <laughs> it works for Bernie. It, that's, so I think what we will come to know, maybe I should be a comedian after this. <laughs> um, I think what we'll come to know when we have our one-on-one -on -one is that she's as tough as nails. And she's not going to go in the gutter with this hateful man. And she's going to keep it elevated. And people will come to know, you know, do I really want an authentic fool in the White House? Or do I want an authentically talented woman? And I think she'll make it. I really do. Thank you for the question. I'm going to change from politics and ask you about your mother. You know, okay. I'm 73, and the older I get, the more I rely on my mother's maxims. Money doesn't grow on trees. <laughs> Two wrongs don't make a right. I want to ask more about your mother. Oh, I'm so happy. Because some of the best stories in here at the beginning, when I lay out the rules of the art of tough and how my mother taught me. Stu, what's the favorite? Should I tell the story about Albert? OK. Tell the story about Albert. Um, one of the things about the art of tough you have to learn, and I mentioned it before, is don't act out of anger because you're going to mess things up. When somebody is confronting you, you've got to figure out a way to deal with it. So how did I learn this? I learned it kind of a painful way. When I was about in sixth grade, there was this kid named Albert. And I was always this size. I mean, I was 4, 11, and 3 quarters when I was in the sixth grade, and I never grew after that. And he was about my size, so he picked on me. It made me nuts. And he uh, would chase me and call me names and all of this. And finally, one day, it just got to me. I couldn't stand it anymore. And I knew I had a couple of options. One, I had one option was to go home and tell my mother to go see the principal. But that I had tried on another kid, and it didn't work. Because his mother came up to, and they both screamed at the principal, and nothing happened. So I thought, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. We tried that way, didn't work. So one day, nobody's looking. It's sort of the end of the school day. He's in my face. He's punching me in the shoulder. You know those kind of punches. like, And that was it. I took out my number two lead pencil. No, I am not Ben Carson, because he does not And I took that number two lead pencil, and I stabbed him in the shoulder where you get a vaccination. <laughs> I was appalled at myself, and I started to cry. He started to cry because he knew he deserved it. So, but we had this little quiet thing going on, and you know, we just acted like it didn't happen, and that was it. So my, I grew up only with Irish, Italian, and Jewish people. That I didn't know a wasp until I met Pete Stark. And then he was in the house with me, and I said happily, Pete, you're the first wasp I've ever met. And he said, no, I'm not. I'm Unitarian. So it <laughs> took me a long time. But, so Albert lived in this little house, and as I walked to school the next day after the stabbing. Uh, I didn't see any activity there. He was absent. The next day, he's absent. I'm walking home from school. I swear to God, over his little, had this little house, little private house, is a big black crepe cloth, which is what they, so this is the anguish of doing something you know you can. My heart was pounding. I knew it. I knew I killed him. So I go home. I said, Mom, I have to talk to you. She says, what is it? I said, I think I killed Albert. She said, what are you talking about? And she said, Barbara Sue, which she said when she was really annoyed. What do you mean, Barbara Sue? Then I tell her the gory details, and she's appalled. How could you do that? We taught you. You never use violence. You don't do that. There's other ways to deal. You should have told me. I tried everything in the book, and she was just mad. She said, but I will call the principal, and I will find out how Albert is. So she calls the principal. 
his grandfather died. So there's a crepe of the... So Albert comes back from school, and I hugged him. Me hugging him. And it was a moment in time when I realized something. And then my mother, just to really teach me exactly the things your mother taught you, she looked at me. Remember, she never went to high school. She says, honey, she says, I want to tell you something. There is a way to tell someone off in such a manner and do it in such a good way, you actually tell them to go to hell, but they don't know you're saying that. They will say, thank you. So she said, taught me, you can tell someone to go to hell, but you can do it in such a way, they will say, thank you. And that explains why Mitch McConnell and I passed the highway bill, because we got over all the stuff after I didn't talk to him for 20 years. You must read about that one. That one takes the cake. But thank you. I, I revere my parents. I do. We've got a time for about two more questions. So only a couple more questions. I know there's somebody over there too. So go ahead. Two more questions. Hi. One of the most important things that you tried to do was get a carbon tax. Yes. And I'm wondering two things. What did you learn from that effort in terms of other things you might have brought to bear behind the scenes? Yeah. And... What actually makes a difference in terms of citizen voice at this point? Is it, is it those petitions that you sign online? I mean, what, what, do you, what do people need? In case we get a decent Congress, right. it's still going to be a gigantic battle. So what helps? Okay. Well, I did get 56 votes for my bill. Um, that was a cap-and-trade bill. But it was a filibustered situation. And if you're wondering why... I'm not for doing away with the filibuster. It's because if we didn't have it, we would no longer have the right to choose. We would no longer have the Clean Air Act. We would no longer have the Clean Water Act. So even though we did away with it for judges and administrative appointments, we did not for these other issues. But that was one time I wish the heck we didn't have it, but we did. Here's what happened. The Republicans, when I first started out, in the 70s were the biggest environmentalists. They call themselves conservationists. And they were the ones leading all of the uh, movement there. I, I remember supporting a state senator named Peter Baer because he was an incredible environmentalist in those days. And I, it was the only Republican in my lifetime. But he was leading the charge on the environment. What happened was the polluting industries essentially took over the Republican Party. That's exactly what happened. And we. We lost the ability to make this bipartisan because everyone was afraid they'd be primaried. So people like uh, um, John McCain, who used to be big on this, he just took a walk, he took a hike, he was gone. And that, so what did I learn from it? The big polluting industries are our enemy. They're trying to stop us from moving to a clean energy economy, and we have to make this a voting issue. Yeah. How about last question? Okay, sir. Uh, Senator Boxer, um, how would your mother uh, tell Donald Trump to take yes. her hand? What do you think the Democratic Party should actually learn from sort of, I would say, the success of Donald Trump in a way where he says things which would scuttle a normal person? Well, to just take all the victims of this man's actions and put them on TV. Remember my race with Fiorina? Remember that one? Good. Uh, the best thing I did was I get to write my own captions, and you have to read the caption under her photographs in the book. But the bottom line is, she was riding high, and really it was a deep recession, and she was blaming me for the recession. She cut an ad that had me, <laughs> had my face on a hot air balloon, and big bloated face, and I crashed, she crashed it through the, the ceiling of the Capitol, which is pretty violent, and then I floated across all the way to California, mumbling insane things, and then <laughs> coming to the Pacific Ocean, and then bursting from my own hot air and going
going into the sea. <laughs> and that really increased my negatives um, because they saw that. So uh, the way we fought her is this. She was running on the bad economy and she knew how to do jobs. Well, guess what? She shipped 30,000 jobs from Hewlett Packard out of the country. And she would just say things that were very appealing, things like, well, nobody on this stage has that background. Nobody understands the choices that we had. And, and everyone who understands it knows. And you know, people are going, hmm. Not, not when we found the people. She fired, put them on TV, and they said not only did she fire me summarily, but she made me train my replacement. And it was, it put the human face on it. So I don't think even, I could say lots of things about my mom, but even this is way past my realm of knowing what she would think. She would be, she wouldn't believe it. She would say something like, I can't even look at that man. You know, that kind of would be the thing. I can't look at that man as if that would make him disappear. So maybe we should all try that. But, um, <laughs> but I think the way you bring it home, you take these people from Trump University. You put them on the television. They tell their stories. And I think, here's a man who says, and I'll close with this, not that I want to close with Donald Trump. I won't, but I'll say this about him. Um, you cannot say, I want to make America great when you don't even know what makes America great, because what makes America great is what we have in this room and we have in the state, the diversity, the, uh, the ability to, to, to look at our differences, but somehow root for one another. This guy doesn't know how to do it, so I think you beat him. You know, you just beat, you just beat him by showing the impact this man has, who says he wants to make America great, and when he had the chance to create jobs, he shipped them to China, and when he had a chance to educate people, he fleeced them, and it just goes on and on. And you beat him with the truth, and you just overcome this entertainer, authentic, whatever it is, shooting from the lip, hip, however he does it. Uh, I think we can do it. Well, I hope all of you will come in the lobby I'm looking forward to personalizing my message and taking a picture. I know that you, you, I know you had fun with this, and I feel like you'll have fun with this book. Thank you so much. Really, it means a lot that you all came. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Boxer, ladies and gentlemen. Barbara Boxer.